Oh, we got Monique Brown on here. Oh, so, you're, so she's here. Oh, all my goodness. Oh, <laughs> like, we're going down with, hi, how is everyone doing? My name is Shelly Willis. I am the CEO and founder of Redefining You Foundation. And boy, are we excited, 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 okay? Look, we are excited to bring to you a four-part webinar series this, this month. Now, normally this month, we would have our RYF symposium where all of these great speakers that you're going to meet this month would come before you, and we really would have some time to do a lot of head, heart, and hand work right so instead of doing it we know why we're not we had to pivot like everybody else and we had to go live and uh get into it so we have our first webinar guest presenter panelist whatever you extraordinaire cordelia yokum and she is a sister a friend and someone that i have had the honor and privilege of being a part of her life and journey and uh if i could say anything specifically just to say how much she has impacted my life and uh, what I see in the lives of others that she's impacted. I would say that it has been beyond, um, I, I just, it's, it's beyond words for me. So I am extremely, extremely pleased that you decided to partner with us in this webinar series as we kick it off. And I'm going to turn it over to you. We have people joining in uh and uh, as they join in we they can be a part of this conversation and we're live on facebook so i want to turn it over to you so that we can get to get to it thank you shell so first of all i just want to say um shelly you said that i was a sister and that you've watched people's lives be impacted by me and that your life has been impacted by me. but my life has been impacted by you and anyone who's read the book you know we're going to be talking a little about this is core conversations yeah, patients from the core. So we're gonna be talking a little bit about the book from the core, um, which details my journey from being bed bound to back in the world again. So being mm -hmm. essentially in lockdown for a decade, there it is, um, to being back in the world again. So we want to hear a lot of you. I see Nancy, I see Monique. Hi, Nancy. Hi, Nancy. I see Eve. Um, so we just want to really make sure that people are asking questions about not only um, the present situation, but also moments that you've had in your life or things that you are feeling have maybe gone to ground, mm -hmm. things that are in lockdown mm -hmm. that need resurrection. So we're going to be talking about healing. We're going to be talking about your full dollar beliefs and behaviors. We'll get all into that, those feelings of I'm not worthy, I'm not enough. Um, and we want to be talking about then moving through that to the other side. Right. right. So Shell, and, and I want to just say for the people who are watching, um, anytime Shell asks me, number one, I'm honored. And number two, I'm just a hard yes. Shell, for you, I'm a hard yes, anytime, it's, anywhere. It's, re it's reciprocated. I'm always a hard yes for you. I so know. I know. Let's Let's get into this conversation. We had a great talk, uh, pre-prep, you know, a prep conversation on Sunday. And man, we were going in saying, let's say something. It's getting juicy. It's yeah. getting good. And um, we really want to, you know, highlight identity intelligence tonight. And we really want to talk about, you know, that 50 cent thinking and versus that full dollar mindset, what you talk about in the in the book as well. So let's kind of get start getting into it. And um, you just got the conversation and we have Eve um, monitoring questions. So there's a little bit of a lag on Facebook. So if we don't catch your question immediately, just know that we're going to get to you. But thank you for joining us on both platforms. Let's okay. Go. So Shell, I want to, you know, some of your redefiners I've already spoken to, they may know a little bit of my story. I think I was with you, I want to say three years ago, was it three uh -huh. years? Conversations. So for those of you who are turning in that knew, know a little bit of my story, I want to not only give you a tiny refresh, but also catch you up to where we are right now in the story. So um, I fell out of a two-story window when I was seven years old and I sustained traumatic brain injury. This is not uncommon, um, certainly in children. That's the number one cause of death and disability in children. But I know that we're speaking to the military and veterans. And so I know TBI is very alive in your community as well. So um, we are, Shelly mentioned, we're sisters. So we are sisters in that. Um, and with my TBI came PTSD. So I'm very familiar with those conversations. If any of you have conversations or questions pertaining to those, I'd love for us to use this platform to start addressing those. In any event, I fell out of a window. I was holding my baby brother. I was seven, he was one, we weighed the same. 
So that gives you a little bit, he was this, you know, like nothing but juice. And I was nothing but skin and bones, right? So I'm, I was holding him on my hip. My dad was renovating our attic. And, you know, we lived in a Tudor house. And Shell, I don't know, you know, Tudor house is not indigenous to the Pacific Northwest where we live. But in the, in the Midwest, Tudor houses are those, they have really steep attics. Right. They're usually made out of brick and the attic is really steep. And so my dad was renovating the attic as my brother, our new addition to the family had come to life. And now we were upstairs and there was a cutout that my dad had made over the steep stairs going down below. Mm-hmm. Um, and this cutout was like, a, you know, where you would put like maybe a planter or a vase or something decorative. Right. It was like a flat ledge. Well, on that day, there was nothing there. It was still under construction. And I had my brother's little bum resting there. And we were talking and my mom was talking to us down below and told us to come downstairs, which we did just not in the way that anyone expected. So to this day shall nobody knows what happened, but somehow my baby brother and I flew over that windowsill and landed on the attic stairs below. I thank God landed on my back and he landed on my stomach. So he did not get hurt. He, you know, went like a bounce. He bounced off my stomach and walked into the kitchen looking for food, you know? And I had, of course, a very different journey from that moment in time. So for me, I went to the hospital, the doctors checked me out, I stayed overnight. And then the next morning they pronounced me fine. But for anyone who's had TBI, those kinds of closed head injuries can be very stealth. Mm-hmm. And it was, and, you know, I'm a woman in my forties and traumatic brain injury just wasn't the topic of conversation like it is now shell. So nobody really knew what they were looking at. And frankly, they didn't even look for anything. So, you know, I wasn't bleeding, nothing was falling off. So they were kind of like cool about the fall and sent me home mm-hmm. and pronounced me fine. Well, I was not fine. So immediately I had all sorts of neurological conditions and I, I, I list them all in the book. I don't wanna sort of take this time to list all the symptomology, but just know that I was pretty debilitated. Yes. And every day was a struggle for me to just make it through the day. However, and this is where 50 cent thinking comes in, because I was going still to doctors, because I had all of these debilitating symptoms, doctor after doctor after doctor said, you're fine. Well, pretty soon after like a year of this, the adults in the room Uh started asking questions like, well, maybe this isn't physical. Maybe this is emotional or mental. And then, and then I started being, um, I was encountered by rejection, contempt, dismissals, where I started thinking to myself and people started saying, what kind of girl needs this kind of attention? What kind of child is jealous of her baby brother? So that was the determination that I must be looking for attention that I was jealous, right? And so it caused what I call 50 cent thinking. It created a schism in me where I no longer thought of myself as, you know, sort of my personality being acceptable, I started thinking something was wrong with me. And because I encountered this rejection, which I know so many of us and so many people walking, watching can really relate to that feeling of rejection. Um, I just vowed to myself that I would do anything to not experience that feeling again. And so I created this persona of this really happy, really cheerful kind of cheerleader personality, like jazz hands, jazz hands, nothing to see here. That was my exterior, but on my interior, I was really struggling with not only the physical symptoms, which frankly were, had kicked me into survival mechanism. So I wasn't even planning like a life. I was really just surviving day to day. And I know, again, there are people on this call that are just surviving the day. Yes. And so when you're doing that, you're really just, you're positioning your personality shell to um, be accepted, be loved. You know, you kind of, in a way, 50 cent thinking is manipulative, stealth manipulative thinking, because you kind of try to manipulate your personality to be acceptable so that, so that you can get what you need. And what you need is love, acceptance, belonging, someone valuing you, you know, and, 
and my pathway to 50 cent thinking was this fall and the consequences of the fall, but other people, you know, their parents came in and said, mom and dad have something to tell you. We're no longer in love with each other. We won't be living together anymore. That equally is a schism, right? right? Or you get bullied in school or, you know, your mom is from a different country and she packs you a lunch that smells funny. And now you're in school and everyone's making fun of you, or you're the wrong race, or you're the wrong weight or whatever it is, those schisms in childhood can develop so quickly and so easily. Mm. And for me, and I just want to kind of set up this 50 cent thinking in full dollar so that as we use this term, people know what it means. So when I was seven, you know, I was just learning the value of money. I think I had this little piggy bank and my dad had gotten me this minted coin collection. It was this little sleeve with red velvet and like a plastic cover. It was super fly. And it had in it like a super shiny penny and a nickel and a dime and a, and a half dollar, 50 cent piece and a full dollar. And I didn't know Shell until I really kind of came out, you know, you know my journey, we're gonna talk about it on this call. But I had this moment where I got a treatment in the ER in my thirties. Um, and it started bringing me back to life. And we'll talk more about that. But, but I, after I had been bed bound for a decade um, with this traumatic brain injury, I actually sustained a second through a car accident. And that was the second assault, as many of you know, in brain injury, that's sometimes the defining brain injury. So then I was bed bound and now I came out of it. And it was only in the physical healing that I started getting space around my survival mechanism. So it wasn't just like, and I'll tell you, once you've been surviving, this sounds so awful, but I'm going to say it. Running a survival mechanism is actually easier than trying to vision cast a life. Wow. 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 Mm -hmm. I'm writing and, it down. Yeah. When you're just surviving, the only thing you have to worry about is surviving that second in front of you. So you're just taking that next step and then that next step and then that next step. And so whatever, pe whatever people's survival is, you know, some of it is you might be in a bad relationship. And so you're just trying to not encounter abuse that day. Uh -huh. Right. Some right. of it is, um, you know, for me, I was just trying. So my predominant symptom was what I call nausea. And I got to tell you, I so wish, Shell, there was another word for what I experienced because to call it nausea is to call, you know, like a massive roller coaster, a ride in a red buggy, like equivalent to what you were experiencing. I mean, but it was off the charts. It was off the charts. It fired all cylinders, right? The nausea was, I felt like I was going to get sick, but every system in my body was firing an alarm alongside the nausea. So it was just extreme. Um, but I want to get back to this idea of 50 cent thinking. Hi, Laura Jones. So oh, I see read your book. Um, we'll put a link to the book on the page and everything. Um, so you all, and some of you, I know Core's on a roll, will No. no. Yep. Yeah. Actually, well, I, I, oh, go ahead, child. Go ahead. I think it's timing. This is so fun. <laughs> <laughs> some of you will uh, receive this book, uh, but we're going to be basing that off of some questions that get asked and uh, you'll be gifted a book uh, personally signed by Core herself. So that's right. That's right. So, um, so 50 cent thinking, I told you about my dad's silver, you know, the, the coin yeah. collection. Mm -hmm. And it was I had one of those, by the way. You did. Oh, girl, I have never met another person. You're when like, you were little, they were like little gifts that you they were doing. The they were so the jam, weren't they? They were like, everyone wanted that. Yes, Monique Brown, you can have a book. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it was after I told you that, like, when you're surviving, you're actually not thinking about anything other than that moment. And so all of a sudden, I'm out of this survival mechanism. And now I'm being flooded by all of these things that I had put on hold, my emotional development, my mental healing, my physical development outside of just surviving, my spiritual development, all of that got put on hold. Uh -huh. So when I started healing, I hired a therapist, which I just want to say for anyone, there is no shame in that. If you're feeling like what you're experiencing and what you're going through is right. a little too much for you, it probably is. Uh -huh. It probably is dealing with, you know, coming out, 
dealing with a life in transition is very difficult to get your footing in. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So I hired um, a therapist. She was also a coach, which is a great combination because she had this ambidexterity. She could both, you know, take me through childhood, but also simultaneously really challenge me to move forward. So it was a great combination, but I hired her. And through that, that session, through sessions with her, I came to realize that something about my seven-year-old mind and that coin connection collection connected Mm -hmm. And defined the experience that I was having when I was seven, because we all reach for things that help us define our experiences, right? So things that we determine our significant. Oh. Things that we determine our significant That's is right. what we connect back to. That's yeah. right. But we use what's in our hand. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? We activate what's in our hand. And so what was in my hand at seven was this coin collection and my seven-year-old brain mind made a connection to that coin collection, made a connection to those feelings of rejection and those, those, um, you know, messages of contempt that I was receiving. And I told myself that everyone else was a full dollar and I was 50 cents. Wow. And that is 50 cent thinking. So because I told myself I was broken, something was wrong with me, I was not lovable, I was not deserving, I was not worthy. And these are all from Nancy. She was telling me about some of these core values, these core Mm. values. So I told myself I was broken and therefore not lovable. So the distance between 50 cents and a full dollar made me develop these behaviors of proving my worth, proving my lovability and doing everything I could to not encounter rejection. And that 50 cent thinking is alive in so many people. And what I wanna really talk to your listeners about today is how to identify your 50 cent thinking and identify the behaviors that come out of that 50 cent Mm -hmm. thinking and Mm -hmm. look at the impact that that has on your life and see if we can't help you find a new way forward. Wow. Well, let's get into it. Uh, I know you have some exercises for us to do. And I, I want everybody to understand because CORE has set a, a, a great foundation. I want you to, right now, you need to be thinking about what was that defining moment? You brought up some key things. What was that defining moment? You know what I'm saying? Uh, mm-hmm. Rosemary, Rosemary says she almost feels like you climbed into her brain with that remark, that mm-hmm. defining moment. And you know, it, you know, when we have our symposium core, you've attended and you've uh, been a part of the session that I feel is very empowered, very powerful. It's that me session. And that's that mm-hmm. time where you, um, things that you've mentioned just in the front part portion of your presentation is just that I'm thinking about that mask. What mattered to me? You know, what mattered to you in that moment was everything yeah. behind that mask. And when you right. think about transition is a hard thing in yeah. any what in any form, right? In any form. And so, any. yeah, you just, and you, so you have to think about how you're going to manage, but not just manage, but thrive while you're going through whatever you're going through. And, and so I, I, I highlighted for those of you that didn't catch it earlier. Yeah when she was talking about survival mechanisms. So I want you to think back. So let's, let's everybody just kind of start to think and play, um, play in your mind uh, about the survival mechanisms we've created for ourselves, even in transition. Yeah. Um, what, are, what is the one thing or things that you found yourself call, call, connecting to because they were significant enough to you to where you even, as you did, added value to it? And I also find it interesting that I'm wondering if the dynamic between the 50 cents is the dollar is almost like I'm a child. I'm seven. So I must only be 50 cents. And my dad is the, you know, he's, he must be a full dollar. So when I grow up, I'm going to be, you know, but you never transitioned from 50 cents to full dollar. You were always that seven year old girl with the 50 cents in, in matching, you know what I'm saying? You I know we're going deep. My mind, shall we? Have to go in it. And, 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 and so I want everybody to be thinking about that. We have so many people that are um, joining us. There's watch parties going on. Thank you for joining <laughs> us. But um, so, so let me go down here. Uh, Nancy just completed reading your book. It's been life changing for me. The book chose me. I didn't choose it. All yeah. right. And uh, Monique said, I truly feel like I have 
several defining moments. And, mm -hmm. and when you think about that, what was that journey like? And if you could just, yeah. if you could go back. Yeah. Well, yeah. I like, I'm my, first of all, how long have you been coloring my journey, right? Like <laughs> Shelly, for those of you who don't know, Shelly has been a voice in my journey for the last four years, three four years. Four years, four years. She just blew my mind live. And, I'll, and I want to talk about what she said. But before we go forward, I want to just address Rosemary, where you said, I feel like you climbed into my brain with that remark. I want to just say something. Rosemary, are you a veteran? Can I ask? Yes. How do you know she is? Uh -huh. She came to our last um, RYF symposium um, and, and just oh, my goodness. Just, yes, she, she is. Yes. Rosemary, I want to say something to you. You know, I here's the crazy thing. So I've been dealing with this. I've been bed bound for all of these years. I received my final diagnosis of two traumatic brain injuries in 2019. Mm, mm. What I think after that, I got yeah. diagnosed with PTSD, but I want to address Rosemary really quickly and say that I spoke to, so this, so, so I have been on this journey the whole time and I didn't get validation from the medical community until a year ago. Wow, that's powerful. But what I wanna say about you feeling like I climbed into your brain is that I was speaking, I wanna say in 2017 to team red, white, and blue. So Shelly and I met through Lean In. Through Lean In, I formed um, Lean In Women Veterans with Lieutenant Colonel Eric Cash and that's when Shelly came in. And she was our liaison between Lean In Women Veterans and the Lean In Seattle chapter. In 2017, I spoke to Team Red, White, and Blue. And I was speaking to someone who'd been an army sniper. And he said something to me, Rosemary, that I will never forget. He said, Cor, I recognize you as someone who, had, who has suffered. And I need you to tell us how to get to the other side. Uh-huh. And I talk about that in my book. And I, I called Shelly because his comment so shook me to the core because Rosemary, if you feel like I'm crawling into your mind, it's only because I had the blessing over my life that someone reflected to me. Like at that point, I still was like, I still was doing jazz hands, jazz hands, nothing uh -huh. to see here. Everything's cool. I'm still a uh -huh. cheerleader. Shelly can attest to that, man. I came screaming to the lean in Seattle stage like, yes, right? Yes. Yes. Epic. Yeah. And it was epic. It was, it was epic. epic, but I was still wounded inside. And it yeah. wasn't until that soldier, when he was like, I recognize you as someone who has suffered. I was like this, who, who suffered? Like I knew uh -huh. I had been down, but I was like, I did not realize my suffering was visible to people who knew what they were looking at. Right. Right. right? It's like, you, you know, like you say, you know, spirit recognizes spirit game recognizes game. Yeah, game. I, see you we see each other I understand that you the you know I understand that you're experiencing some level of trauma and and to Rosemary's um you know her her point you can literally be like the walking dead and nobody unless someone's been there or they're on that journey themselves they can't identify with your struggle what you're what you're trying to do you can't even form the words of what you're trying to say because of the trauma that you've experienced as you've gone, you're, you're on this journey. And people might think that it's easy. Let's just, oh, you, it's like, you got a brand new life. You can do this. No, you can't. It is, you can't, you can't. And, and I also like to tell people in the military community that TBIs and PTSD, we didn't ask to own that. The world kind of gave it to us and then we didn't correct it. We didn't course correct. Mm. More than, you know what I'm saying? We're not even the highest, we didn't, we're not even the high, you know, what is it? Car accidents, traumatic car accidents, the car accidents. So it's, it's, uh, it's also what you decide you want to own. And at some, and, and at your seven-year-old mind told you to own the 50 cents. And then with everything else that happened after that, you never were able to own the full dollar until you had a moment. Well, girl, I want to get back to when you blew my mind. because Okay. <laughs> It just blessed me. Like, I feel like I could just drop the mic hang up now because Shelly's just like, like just blessed me major. And I want to just share what, what I want to articulate what just happened. So Shelly said something so pivotal. She said, your dad gave you that coin collection. And I wonder if part of your seven-year-old mind was the child was 50 cents and the father was the full dollar. 
and that that and that the adults in my world were telling me that it was a character issue and that I was still a child and I was behaving like a child. Mm. And I want to talk to you about trauma because trauma causes something called developmental delays. And we hear a lot about that when children have physical disabilities, right? They have developmental delays. Maybe they don't speak as quickly, or maybe they don't walk as early, or maybe they don't learn their ABCs as early. Right. And there could be some sort of developmental delay by way of, you know, some type of, um, um, not trauma, but some type of just learning development, right. learning right. disability that causes a developmental delay. Trauma does the same thing. Okay, got it. And what was so powerful and what is so important, Shell, about what you said is that, you know, and I only learned about developmental delays again in therapy, but I had dated someone who was an alcoholic. And what I learned about alcohol, alcoholism and alcoholics is that they stop emotionally maturing when they begin drinking. Mm. And when you encounter someone that's maybe been drinking for 20, 30 years, and all of a sudden they're going sober, and let's say they started drinking at 16, mm-hmm. right? And now they're 30 years later, they're, they're 46. You're not encountering a 46-year-old. You're encountering a 16-year-old. Exactly. Trauma is the same thing. So when I got hurt at seven, I stopped developing emotionally. So your comment about being a child of like having the correlation between 50 cent thinking and, and childish thinking. And I hope you know what I mean by that. Uh Childish as in childlike, Uh not mature. You are 1000% correct. And so part of what was the most difficult and for, for your listeners, part of what's going to be really powerful about this transition that you're going through, if you've been suffering from trauma of any kind, and right now all of us are, are having a traumatic experience, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. there is a developmental delay that will occur. And so right. if you got hurt, I got hurt at seven. If some of you had traumatic experiences when you were younger or whenever they occurred, it's a, it's a high chance and a high probability that you are in a way stuck there if you've not been doing the healing. Mm-hmm. So when I came out, when Shelly met me, I was two years out of, you know, learning about my trauma and I was probably nine. Uh Well, you probably met nine-year-old Cordila. So Uh a lot of what I've been doing on this journey and much of what the, what the um, book is about is a developmental delay maturation process. Wow. That's what the book is about. And that is happening for me on a physical level, on a mental level, on an emotional level, and on a spiritual level. It's maturation. Okay. And I love that, like, I love that you gave word to that because you are 1000% correct. Man, that, and then it's like the, the visual of what that could look like. I would love it. I don't know if y'all have an artist, but I would love someone to visually draw that out. Like, I would love to see what that looks like visually. Yeah. Um, Monique, uh, Monique Brown was like, uh, wow, now you just blew my mind. I think that just laying it out, right? Mm-hmm. Laying it out. We talked a lot about, um, you know, it could feel like you're going from challenge to triumph. You know, how do you get from it? But sometimes people in this moment right here, that space in between the two, yeah. They're swirling, they're cycling. They can't seem to get out of whatever that is. Yes. And how do you make that shift happen? And mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, we're yeah. not going to leave that out. We're going to, we're going to, no. <laughs> we're not going to leave gonna that out. Address. And, and yeah. we talked about the root in the process. Yeah. And so how do you come out to new? What is that like? And so being productive. And I know you have like some exercises, but let's talk. I want to, it was something I saw in the book today. And if you all have not, <laughs> we're going to get to that exercise in just a second, but it was something in, in the book. Let me get to the, it's in chapter 18. If you, you know, haven't seen it yet. Um, and it's, uh, it's where your friend Teresa, you know, is talking to you. Mm-hmm. And Teresa says something I thought was really profound and I think should be a part of this transition discussion. Her quote is really good. You're not looking for a job. Like you were unfocused. You weren't clear, right? Um, And in this particular point, this December uh, 2017, and you're not looking for a job. You said you're you're still looking for validation, okay? The enemy of destiny is distraction. That is what steals your efficacy. 
So I, 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 when I was, I was, I have a lot of things highlighted and, and probably like Nancy, I got, I just don't have a bunch of tabs, but I have a lot of things highlighted in this book. Okay. And, um, this book is powerful. And so when you think about the root in process, how do you come out new? The enemy of your destiny is distraction. Let's walk that out. I want to walk that out because in this chapter, you, you, you labeled this chapter lock and load. That's mm -hmm. a familiar term if you've been oh, in the yep. amount of time. Yep. But you're being challenged, I believe, here yeah. in this chapter. Yeah. Well, first of all, Teresa is not my, she is my friend, but she also is my therapist. Yes. So that is the woman who spoke over my life mm -hmm. and said those things to me. So just if you ever have not, if you've not been to therapy, you want an inside glance on what that sounds like, there it is. Pick up the book and anytime you see Teresa, that's what therapy sounds like. So therapy is really challenging you um, by addressing exactly where you have weaknesses. And Teresa, by that point, knew profoundly mm -hmm. that my weakness was in seeking validation, seeking right. someone to tell me that I was valuable. Uh -huh. And um, so she called it out. She called uh -huh. it. Out. So I want to take a minute and just have everyone grab a journal. So when you get a journal, can you just, I'm going to take a sip of water and can you just, I'll, we're going to give you, you know, 10 seconds to grab a journal and a piece of pen, a, a piece of paper and a pen. And then um, we're going to come back when you have it. Can you just say in the chat that you've got your journal shell? Can we take 10 seconds? Yes, we're going to take 10 seconds because I also know there's a delay on Facebook and there's several watch parties. So if you are just joining us, a lot of you wanted to know what the book was. This is the book from the core by Cordelia. Cordelia Locum. I never, Yocum, I never say her name right. She knows I never do. I try so hard. Cordelia Yocum. There you go. So, um, my friend and sister, so there you go. Um, uh, we, uh, if you want to get the book, get the book, but you don't need it right now. Uh, we just want to give you time to get in my message today, something to write in and something to write with. And some of y'all might need something to drink. This is going deep. <laughs> this is going deep. You might need some tissue and you might need a little bit of something. And understand this is completely transparent, but we want you to know. Um, um, she's so funny. She told me the chat how to say it. Yes, yo, got, got it. <laughs> I know. So for, since I jacked it up and I was really Great. working hard on practices. I love you. I love you. I'm so sorry. So no, no. we're getting ready to get started now. Everyone should have something to write in and with. We want you to sit back, relax, and relax and enjoy the ride as we get started on this uh, journey um, of a core, good core conversation. Yeah. Hi, Manny. So Manny he, said he got it. Yes. Manny's got it. Monique's got it. Ellen's got it. So we've got, so just one more time for anyone joining us, uh, if you can grab a journal and grab a pen. Um, and we're going to get into some exercises on 50 cent thinking and just a quick catch up for anyone who's joining us. 50 cent thinking is thinking that you are unworthy, unlovable, less than broken, any of those things that you tell yourself or that you may have told yourself that's a rut that causes you to encounter circumstances and situations that are subpar. So what we're going to do first is just have a look right here. We've got 50 cent beliefs, behaviors, and impact. So what we're gonna do is try, try to identify your 50 cent thinking. So does anyone have a thought where they tell themselves, you know, I fell out of the window when, you know, when I was seven, doctors couldn't identify what was wrong with me. I sustained traumatic brain injury. And because the adults in the room couldn't determine what was wrong with me, I told myself I was broken. So what I told myself I was broken and, and consequently, I was unlovable. Something was profoundly wrong with me, not only physically, which was my brokenness, but on a character level, which, which made me foundationally unlovable. So I spent most of my time trying to validate my worth as a human and trying to seek love from the most unlikely places. So not only did I try to find validation, but, but there were people in my life that gave me validation. Here's the crazy thing. I wanted nothing to do with that. Uh. If people believed I was valuable because I believed I wasn't, I didn't actually, I wasn't actually able to receive the love. 
Okay. So the only people I hung around were the people that substantiated my belief in myself, therefore treated me like 50 cents. And as the years went by, it wasn't only 50 cents, it was 45 cents, and then it was 40 cents. And by the time I walked out of my relationship three months before my wedding, what had gone on in my life was I was being treated like a nickel. And that was the moment where I finally said, I may not be a dime, but I know I'm a nickel. And that's the moment where I took a stand and walked out of my life. But the impact of 50 cent behavior and my 50 cent belief almost cost me my life. And I, and I talk about it in the book. I don't want to go into all of the elements in the book, but it really literally almost cost me my life. I put myself in physical danger. I put myself in financial danger. I put myself in emotional danger and I did that. I have to take, you know, part of the coming out of this Shelly and part of the being the adult full dollar is taking total authority of your actions. Ownership. 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 Gotta own it. Take, I had to take ownership of my behavior. And once I did that, I looked at the impact of my life. Okay. So if anyone, so I'd love to just, if anyone's feeling brave, I'd love to really talk about maybe some of those 50 cent beliefs that you have. So again, you just write down 50 cent thinking. So this is 50 cent thinking and the 50 cent thinking is the umbrella and it encompasses 50 cent beliefs, 50 cent behaviors, and then the impact. So when you look at your life, you say the impact of my, my 50 cent belief and my 50 cent behaviors is that I'm in a relationship that, that where, that's unsafe. That's unsafe, or I'm at a job where I'm not valued or, you know, whatever it is in your life. So I want to really get clear on the impact. So is anyone feeling brave enough to sort of surface their 50 cent belief? You can put it in the chat. Um, yeah. If you're on our Facebook live stream, uh, Eve will catch it. Uh, and then there's a watch party. So if you want to participate, repeat one more time for what you want them to do. So, and I'll show you too. So you have, you have 50 something. It's a little bit there. Can you see it now? Mm -hmm. I see it's clear. So it says 50 cent thinking looks like 50 cent beliefs, 50 cent behaviors and impact. So all you want to write down is I believe I am blank. My 50 cent thinking is I believe I am blank. So I believed I was broken and unlovable. And Nancy, I'm gonna use some of yours if that's okay. There are other beliefs that say, I believe that I am undeserving of something. I believe I'm unworthy. That's another one. So if any of these resonate with you, or if they don't, if you feel something different, but something 50 cents that has caused a negative impact in your life. Shell, you know, we've never really talked about this, but I know you struggled with some of your transition for different reasons, but do you feel like you have anything 50 cents that come, has come up in your life? I believed that I was never good enough. Mm -hmm. That's and uh, because of that thinking um, in my own story, but because of that thinking in the military, I was always, I wasn't the picture perfect soldier even though I was, I was on it. I was good. I was, I was good, but I wasn't what you, what, what people wanted to see when they saw a soldier. So, um, I always talk about the story of being second, always second. Now I wasn't the last person chosen for kickball, but I wasn't all, I wasn't the first choice, but I would always defeat or beat or win in the first choice never would. So when it came to competitions and doing all the things, I would win, but I was not the first choice. And in my mind, I always had to work harder to prove that I should have been your first choice. We wouldn't have even had to go on this long transitional road. And then at some point at an impasse, um, I made a decision that regardless of whether I'm the first choice or not, I do believe that this is my, 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 my work ethic and everything about me yeah. was meant to be for me and not to measure up to anybody else. So I learned maybe around it, I think really came clear to me around my thirties that I, my only competition should be myself and that I'm good enough. I'm good enough. Do you have a sense, Shell, um, where that came from? Like, was there a define, you talk about a defining moment. Was there a defining- Growing up, growing just different up. things growing up, um, being the oldest and probably not feeling. Mm you know, just, you know, different things like that. So there are just 
never feeling like you were enough, um, always chasing something and then realizing that you don't have to. You yeah. are beautiful. Um, you know, I always talk about colorism, you know, being the dark skinned one in the family. But yeah, I, I mean, that, that's, in, but those things that happened to you in childhood, as we clearly talked about, can, can continue to go and grow with you. I can relate to anybody who felt like they always had to work hard to get approval or feel like they would be loved more if they did more. These things happen to people. And even though the even though it may not seem like that to the in the moment, yeah. once you start to think back, why did I feel like I wasn't enough? Yeah, you know, I was just talking last week about a family photo, an old one, when you know, when I was younger, um, and my parents were married. How I was the artist that did it. I was literally almost black as my shirt, and everybody else is fair skinned mm. You know, and I see, I see. So we're getting some comments, but that's my journey. So. Um, not good enough is Mar is Manny. Um, Monique Brown says she believed that um, she was dumb. I still feel like I would. I must work harder than others. Um, Marsha said that she was always told that when she was a child too. That she was, you know. And then Monique also mentioned her dark skin made her feel ugly. My grandmother used to always say things like, "I think she knew." My grandmother knew I had a complex, um, and she would say, "The black of the berry, the sweet of the juice, anything to make me think positive about my dark skin." Yeah. Um, but that rolled over with to me and then when I had experiences in the military because I wasn't you know like this in the military you know height weight is a thing I uh, those were my experiences well we didn't select you I even I've had leaders tell me well we didn't want you to go up for this competition or this board and then I go and not only do I kick butt I made them look good right and then they had to come back and say something. So it's 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 been a, it's interesting. It's very interesting that fifty cent thinking thinking about it. Yeah, uh, Monique Brown said uh, her dark skin made made her feel ugly, and her mom used to say exactly that. For the very the the juice. Yes. Yeah. And it's so important to have people, you know, speak and it, it can be, it, it can actually be really confusing. You know, um, I say in the book too, my dad called me Schatz and Schatz in German means treasure. Mm, mm. And, and the irony that, that, you know, and I'm actually thinking the irony deeper is that treasure is often coins, right? right? You think mm -hmm. of like a pirate's treasure, a pirate bounty. Um, mm -hmm. So I was on one hand being spoken treasure and shuts, and on the other hand, feeling like really broken. And on the one right. hand, you were saying, you know, darker the berry, sweeter the juice, and yet you equally really struggled with your, with your skin. And so that that dichotomy of like which way am I going to lean what am I going to listen to and this is part of like this um identity intelligence that we're going to talk about that is going to be because that stuff never stops no it never stops rejection never stops you have to learn how to process rejection and yeah. I had to learn how to not internalize yeah I had to learn how to own my space and protect it you know um, yeah. It looks like Laura said, my little girl voice makes me feel like people don't take me seriously. And then that makes me feel like I'll never be taken seriously. And that's definitely not true. Yeah. Um, but I understand that. I understand that. Yeah. So what are some of the, and first of all, thank you everyone for putting those in, you know, we're talking about some real stuff here and I really appreciate the bravery that it takes to, to put your name assigned to your 50 cent thinking because we all see your name and now we see your 50 cent thinking that takes real courage and I very much appreciate the participation and the courage that it takes to say it out loud. Um, oh, Carrie, you're the one. I believe that happiness wasn't for me. Oh, wow. like I have to be in some chaos or hurt to be seen providing happy things or doing nice things for others was not seen. Oh, girl. Wow. Like Wow, I feel that. I feel Thanks that. For sharing, Carrie. That was ooh, that's good. Happiness wasn't for me. They're all very good. Thank you all for being so um, open. Yeah, I would say not transparent. That wouldn't be the word. I think open is the word. And Carrie, I'm going to come back to that. We're going to come back to that at the end because that's so profound. That idea of happiness not being for you, and that's exactly what Fifty Cent thinking, Rosemary. I don't deserve to be happy. Isn't it? Isn't it fascinating that that Fifty Cent thinking actually stops you from accessing happiness? Mm. 
that is like what's becoming so clear to me. It stops you from accessing happiness. And, you know, and I want to, I'm going to pick that up on the end because that is where we're going. If you want to know where this whole conversation is going, it's to free you up from some of these things that keep you bound from accessing your happiness. Like I am just taking a stand that everyone on this call has the right to pursue happiness and find it and own it. Like I feel myself almost sweating with the power of saying that because I just want to claim that. And, and PS, I have to claim that for myself. Like I'm claiming that for myself. Mm -hmm. I am determined that the next 12 years of life that I live will be inside of happiness and joy. Yes. So mm -hmm. that's where we're going. That hope is attached to this happiness and joy as well. So I love that, Carrie. I love that, Rosemary. We're going to come back to that. So after you've identified these beliefs, I want to think about the behaviors that have come out of these beliefs. Any idea? So for me, um, in fact, I'm just going to tell you, since we're being open, I'm just going to tell you something that happened today. This happened. Because <laughs> here's the thing. Once you identify these 50 cent, 50 cent beliefs, 50 cent behaviors, it's not that they just disappear. Right. That you 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 start to be able to identify what your personal weakness is what your former belief is your 50 cent belief and then consequently your 50 cent behaviors that and you'll be able to identify them quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker so i right. had a circumstance happen today you know how facebook gives you those like pleasant little notifications like oh you should friend this person and friend this person so i right. met a woman several years ago when i was down talking to the navy um down in California at the Naval Reserve or at the Naval Academy. I met her, we were out one night, she had great hair. I have you know, curly hair, she had curly hair. And so I asked her where she got her haircut and we connected. She ended up coming, I invited her to have dinner with us. We, we really connected, we had a fun time. So it's been now a long time since I've communicated with this woman and I friended her on Facebook the other day. Cause I was like, oh, I remember her, cool. Like I'll friend her on Facebook. <laughs> she don't remember you. <laughs> no girl, this is what happened. So she. She comes back to me today, okay? This is so hysterical. And she invites me to like her public page. Oh, oh. Right? Oh, okay. So here's what I wanna say about that. If anyone thinks that I didn't feel rejected, like I felt like for a minute- That's like, not your personal life, this is your public life. I can like, I can be a part yeah. of that. Yeah, you're welcome to like me, uh, right? Like, I'm not going to be like, I'm not going to be friending, accepting your friend request, but you're, you're welcome to like my public page. Again, you're not good enough. That's exactly where that hit me. Again, That's you're not good exactly enough. exactly where that hit me. You're not lovable. Um. Right? So instantly, and I want to share this with people because instantly my mind went back to, what did I do wrong? Why doesn't she like me? What happened? We had so much fun. And I, and I, even when I'm saying this, do you know what I hear in my voice? Hmm. Child. I hear the child in me speaking. Right. So here's the good news. The good news is what I did, and we talked, Shelly, before about going to the root. Right. Very quickly, these five years that I've been shoring up my 50 cent thinking and stepping into my full dollar boss. Uh-huh. I now, it's not that I never had that thought because like I said, this happened this morning and not even, you know, 12 hours ago. Okay. Right. So instantly I went back to my 50 cent thought of I'm not lovable, but I had to get to the core. I had to go to the core and I want to talk to you. We, we are going to talk about spirituality. It's so important because that who you believe you are at the core is the only thing you can rely on. Wow. To realign your identity. So I have had this massive, you know, what I'll tell you, I was not a woman of faith, mm. not a woman that went looking for God as my answer, not at all. Mm -hmm. I held this belief that if there was a God, that God's job was to heal me physically and PS, he could get on that pretty quickly anytime, but I had no expectation of a God outside of that, just if there is a God, his job is to heal me physically. What I didn't right. expect is to be encountered by this beautiful understanding of 
what sits at the core of my being, which I've come to define as God. Uh And that from that source, I now live my life. Okay. The only thing, and you know, and it's so important, Shell, and I want to just drive this point home because there are people right now that have lost the labels in their life. And those labels are often what we attach our identity to. So master sergeant, symbol, manager, Mm -hmm. or lieutenant colonel, or, you know, whatever it is, or mother, or lover, or girlfriend, or sister, or whatever, auntie, right? All of these things we attach our identity to. And when those things leave our life, we are crushed and we don't know who we are. Right. There are people right now in the coronavirus pandemic that have lost their jobs. They have lost their titles. They don't know how they're going to make their next rent payment. They don't know where they're going to find their next meal. This is real. Yeah. You know, and, or they've lost relationships. They were in a relationship that seemed fine until the pressure happened. And now they're in this sort of pressure situation and there's no pressure relief valve. And now relationship is going to pot. And core, these transitions that they're going to go, that they're going through, they're not voluntary. These are forced moments. Right. You have no choice. You have no say. You have no say. So I want to just share, I want to share the story. I tell it in the book, but I want to share it with you, with your readers right now. I want to talk about Rattlesnake Ledge. Okay. I love so, that story. <laughs> I love this story. So Rattlesnake Ledge, you know, when I came back to life, I had not used my physical body. So again, I had traumatic brain injury at seven. I had another, a second assault in traumatic brain injury in a car accident when I was in my mid thirties. A few months after the car accident, I was no longer able to care for myself. I had to liquidate my business, move out of my loft in Manhattan and move into my parents' house in Liberty Lake, Washington, which is Nowheresville, USA. Uh-huh. I went from a loft in Manhattan fashion designer traveling the world and selling into, you know, Fifth Avenue stores to living with my parents and not, be, not able to care for myself. I uh-huh. lost everything along the way. Uh-huh. And I was bed bound for 10 years. Uh-huh. And for the first several years of those, I did not leave bed for 23 out of 24 hours a day. I was not really awake more oh. than one hour a day. Okay. So that's how extreme it was. For 10 years, I'm bed bound. I leave my relationship. I leave the, the thought of becoming a mother. Uh-huh. So people who are losing things that you don't know how you're going to recover. And you also know you may never recover. Uh-huh. I walked out of my relationship as a woman in my 40s, knowing that I probably was leaving the idea of motherhood on the table. Wow. So I, fo- I foundationally and fundamentally understand some of these deep losses that will stay with you for the rest of your life. Yes. But I had made a new friend and generally, you know, like you don't really make a lot of friends when you're bed bound. I, a few people came in and out of my life during those 10 years, but mostly not. And so I came back to life in mid 2014 by mid 2015, I was hiking Rattlesnake Ledge. Now I want to just say for anyone who doesn't know, I got super outfitted for Rattlesnake Ledge. Okay. I went to a hiking store in Seattle. I bought a backpack with the little the little straw that you can like fill up your water jug. (laughs) So I had the straw and like on my strap, I had a backpack fitted for me, like the super expensive ones where they measure you and they actually fit you for a backpack. I got super fly hiking boots and I hiked up Rattlesnake Ledge. You got geared up. You got the, you got the gear that you needed to perform the task or go on the mission that you were trying to go on. Go soldier on, soldier on. You were geared up. Proper, I was geared up. Equipment. Yes. I was geared up. But here's the other gear that's on Rattlesnake Ledge. A soldier, uh, not a soldier, a seven-year-old hiked past me in flip-flops. Okay. <laughs> so I'm like geared up and a seven-year-old is like chill as ice walking past me in flip-flops. Okay. So that's the difficulty of Rattlesnake Ledge. Anyway, I don't let that stop me. I walk up Rattlesnake Ledge. I was like, right. I walk up Rattlesnake Ledge. I get to the top. It's two miles up, two miles down. I get to the top. My friend, my brand new friend says, Hey, look at the view. I wanted nothing to do with the view. I was like, yeah, yeah. It's gorgeous. I'm out of here. Shell. I was so freaked out that I was going to need to be airlifted off the mountain, like, or, you know, have some event on the top. Like, really, can't you just it 
my body had so terrorized me for 40 years that I was not in the mood to enjoy the view. Thanks. Like I was off that mountain. So we went up to the mountain. We went down the mountain. I don't even really remember. We get down to the bottom and it was my friend Diane was cleaning the, she had a dog with her and she was cleaning Stella's paws off and kind of getting the car ready. And I could finally exhale. And it was in the parking lot when I had this moment of realization of what I'd done. And I was looking at this beautiful glistening rock face. If anyone knows Rattlesnake Ledge, you're in the parking lot and you're staring up. It's called a ledge because it's like this. It's it's like this sheer cliff and you're actually staring at the cliff face when you're in the parking lot. And so it was this beautiful, glistening, moist, you know, black, glossy cliff face. And I had this realization that I actually topped that with my body. Wow. My body that hadn't been out of bed for a decade, my body that couldn't be relied on, my body that had terrorized me and staring at this rock in my face, just like, it just overwhelmed me. I was overwhelmed with gratitude. And I looked up to the left and there's my new friend. I have a new friend. I didn't even know that I had that skill anymore. I didn't even know that you could make a new friend in your forties. I had this new friend, I had this body that could be even just for one day relied on to hike. And then there was this stacking. It would kind of look like a rocket pop. It was the sun was setting over this beautiful field in front of me. And it was like orange and red and pink. It was so beautiful. And I was so overwhelmed with gratitude. And I just kept saying over and over, this is beautiful. This wow. is beautiful. This is beautiful. And I heard back. So are you. Wow. So are you. Mm. And in that moment, that schism in my life went like this. Wow. And I was made whole in a moment. I understood in that second that there was nothing wrong with me, that that same powerful creative life force that was in that rock face, that same unbelievable beauty that was in that stacked sunset was in me. That wow. creative life force was in me. And that wholeness has never left me. Even now it overwhelms me to realize I'm, that I'm, I'm feeling it. Others are feeling it. Yeah. I'm seeing it in your eyes, in your face is flush. Your eyes are gl glossy. And I just had another moment. And yeah. I'm thinking at that moment, you became the full dollar. At that moment, you had another moment, That's right. which then leveled out that now I'm whole, now I matter. Like, and, and it's like out of the heart, the mouth speaks. You heard what your heart has been desiring. So, you know, I do believe that God's, you know, look, that's a, that's a Holy Spirit. That's a, that's a moment. That's a whole spiritual moment. It, whatever, whoever was used in that moment. That's right. The message that God needed to get to you so that you could connect. Yeah. But I want to be more beautiful. I want to be super clear. It wasn't that I became whole is that I always had been whole. Yes. It was, it was, it's time for you to, it's time for the, the seven-year-old needs to go. It's time for her to go. And it was bringing it to you. Like you've been, it's almost like visually, here's another visual. You're scratching at it. Like I see it. It's like a gift you're trying to open. And you know how you have, sometimes it's hard to tear the paper off only to get to the gift that was already in you, to the thing that you already were. And then you see it and you're like, I already had this. Yeah. This is something I already have. Yeah. You've always had wholeness, but you, you needed that schism, as you said, you needed that moment to happen. That's right. And that wholeness and what I've realized now, now that I see possession of self, yeah. And Laura and Carrie, Monique, now that I see wholeness in myself, I realize that wholeness is in every single human being. Yes, yes. Wholeness, not just in me, that wholeness is in you. Mm. And what I want us to do is take, get your notebook back out again, and we're going to write the same things down. So at first we wrote 50 cent thinking. Now we're going to write full dollar birthright. Your wholeness is your full dollar birthright as a human being. 
We're going to give you a few seconds to do it. Yeah. We're going to give everybody a full second. You got Laura on here saying, hell yeah. <laughs> I feel like we need a praise break, you know? <laughs> we need a praise break. So, of self, yes. And I want to, I want to bring this back to the Facebook thing that happened to me this morning. So when <laughs> those things happen, right? So I realized in that moment that I was whole and complete and I've come to realize that voice as the reality that I am a child of God. Yeah. So I recognize that voice over time. Like, again, I didn't just, it wasn't like the clouds parted and God spoke to me and I was like, woo, Jesus, right? Like that was <laughs> not the journey. That was not the journey. That was the moment, but then there was a journey that attached to that. And I am yes. open, as some of you read from the core, I'm so open to discussing that journey because like I said, it was unexpected. Sometimes I came to it kicking and screaming and Shelly can attest to that. But what I've realized is that, you know, sort of that creative life force, that mm. voice that spoke back to me is God. As a child of God, I am whole and complete just as I am. Right. So when when that woman did not want to friend me on Facebook this morning and I had that 50 cent thought that I am not worthy and I am unlovable, the first thing I do is go right here. And I remind myself that I am whole and complete just as I am. I need nothing. I need nothing. I have everything I need. I am a child of God. And I hook there first. And then I take authority over my life and I say, what are you going to do with this information core? You choose. Wow. You choose your behavior from this moment. You're going to think about it all day. You're going to write something snarky back. What are you going to do? And from that full dollar thought and that full dollar identity, I have a full dollar belief that I'm whole and complete just as I am. That is connected to my core identity. And from that wholeness, I act out in the world. That is what drives my behavior. So the root it, the process, could we say that? Could that be like root? The root, the root That's process. Right. So we asked, Cora yeah. just asked everyone to write down your full dollar. Your full dollar worth, right, is your identity. So the question is, who do you say you are? Mm. Who do you say you are? I said, I am a child of God. Everyone is going to have your own journey. And I fully understand if your faith journey doesn't look like my faith journey, I'm okay with that. But you need to speak something over your life. That's a better word that is different than I'm not worthy. I am broken. You have to, something has to speak a better word over your life and you need to have that be an immovable force. Yes. You don't know how to get to that conversation other than to go directly to God. But you have to take that journey yourself. And I just stand believing. And I know Shelly, you stand believing with me. You know, I didn't, I didn't walk in a church. Mm. I didn't crack the Bible. I didn't listen to a sermon. God encountered me at Rattlesnake Ledge. Wow. I just know that if you need a word, if you need a word over your life, who you are, that you can be met anywhere you are at any time. Mm. I believe that for you. I know that for you. Wow. You need to write that stuff in here. Jimmy You're said, right. I am whole. And yeah. uh, Monique is saying, I am a child of the most high. I have everything I need and more inside. That's I just right. have to reach for it. That's right. It, Yep. It is not out of your reach. That's it right. Is not out of your reach. Yes. Yes, yes girl. Yes. And and I love it. I am a badass. What's your hashtag, Laura? Do you remember your hashtag? Everybody, when we met Laura Jones, let me tell you something. Yeah. Give it to me. She gave the, the mayor of Tacoma at that time, she was running for mayor. She spoke at RYF that time and um, Laura's Hashtag is don't let this little voice fool you. And Laura, if you can give that hashtag, then you can use that to walk through yeah. everything that you're doing. People, you already know once you speak, people are going to underestimate you, but that's what you're assuming. And, and I don't want you to assume that first. It's almost like you're thinking for the person. You're making the decision that they're not going to take you seriously that's based right. off of what you have a an issue with what what you feel is your your challenge but that could be your most your strongest feature 
right. because of your little voice. And then when you bite, honey, you bite, you bite, right? You bite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would even say, Laura, you know, little voice, little voice, like even that right there is a 50 cent thought. If I can be so bold as to say. Oh, I'm loving this. Oh, I'm, you see these? Oh, I'm loving it. You know, I, I think that angels probably have an octave similar to yours. So I think coming up with a different, you know, like Shelly said, you sort of encourage people to pre-think. You pre-think what you think they're thinking, um, but you're packaging it in 50 cent thinking. Yeah. So I'd really just love to encourage you to find that full dollar boss inside you, hook into your full dollar birthright, your identity, who you say you are. And I guarantee you, it has nothing to do with a little voice. Nothing. At all. At all. Nothing. I'm loving it. Mm -hmm. and, and I want to come back to Monique. Shell, can we save these chats? Is that possible? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> you can. I'd love to save these chats. You will try. I think when you pull it back up, you can. It, it's recording everything. I think it's yeah. recording the chats and everything. I love that. So, but I want to talk about, Monique said something about, I, it's going too fast, I can't catch up with it, but Monique said something about um, having to reach for it. Yeah, she said, yeah, she has everything, it, it, she has everything that she needs, she and has all she has to do is reach for it. It's, it's yeah. right there. Yeah, and I want to also disabuse the idea that we have to reach for anything. So, mm. also, and did you hear that, Monique? That's also a 50 cent behavior that we have to do anything and reach for anything. Mm. That wholeness is that if you're complete, you don't need, you have. Yes. So yeah. that chance, and you know, part of in the book, I really had to enter what I, and I, there's a chapter called embracing training. Embrace right. training. I had to get trained. I had to go to basically, you know, full dollar boot camp, basically, where I had to learn how to receive and stop reaching. I had to learn that. That is not a behavior that I come by naturally. And I have to tell y'all, I have to share this story with you. Yeah. Shakur and I have had many, 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 many moments on the phone. <laughs> and I have, when you have someone that is um, on your board of trustees, someone that you consider to be a confidant, but not because they will hold close your, your deepest, secrets or thoughts, but because they will hold you accountable. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm, I'm big on accountability. I, I, I kick myself in the butt all the time, but you need to know and understand that there are moments when she, we've had conversations and I don't know what we were talking about, but it was the day I told you to get off of that cross. Jesus already did that. And he didn't ask you to help him. He didn't say he needed you to die on the cross again. Get off of the cross. Jesus didn't ask you to join him. He didn't, he didn't say he needed your help. And uh, I cannot remember what we were talking about, but sometimes we make ourselves the sacrifice when we don't, we don't need to be the sacrifice. It's almost like that's something that we, you know, we, we need to do to feel better about whatever happened. Yeah. Shell, we're going to go there. Okay. I'm just not holding back. Your family's okay. my family. These are your people. These are my people. So yeah. we're not going to hold anything back. I know exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I, so part of my 50 cent behaviors, we talked about 50 cent beliefs drive 50 cent behaviors, and then that yields an impact. Okay. So my 50 cent belief was that I was unlovable. Where do you go looking for love? Put it All in the wrong place. <laughs> Where do you go looking for love? Wow. So my you know, I don't want to say it, it was a weakness, my pattern of shoring up my I am not lovable was getting love from other people. So I allowed a lot of men in my life. Mm. And I'm just going to put that out there. Wow. So when Shelly encountered me, I had already had this, you know, I was in the process of this full dollar, you know, process, I had stopped dating after I walked out of my engagement, out of a relationship, <clears throat> I just choked on myself because it's so hard to talk about. Like, this is what's happening, right? Like it's, it's hard to talk about. Yeah. I walked out of a relationship where I was being treated like 50 cents, if that, 
And I stopped dating because I felt like I couldn't trust myself Mm. and I needed to learn how to behave differently. Right. So I went on a couple of dates and I was super proud of myself. I was doing so great. Hashtag full dollar, full dollar. I think Manny put full dollar boss, hashtag full dollar boss mm-hmm. until I met Jake. Mm. And Jake is in the book. Jake is his real name. Jake signed the waiver is super pleased to be in the book, but Jake was a bad decision. Mm. He was a 50 cent decision. Mm. And we got into a circumstance that looked very much like my past circumstances of 50 cent behaviors. And I called Shelly crying, Mm -hmm. saying, I'm not new at all. And I felt this mountain of shame. Mm -hmm. That and that's something that happens when these 50 cent thoughts come back and we execute 50 cent behaviors. It's like we rewind all the way to the beginning. Yeah, It's like I, I wanted to steal all of the hard work that I had done. I wanted to just erase that. It's like that none of that had happened and I was right back to where I had started. That's what I was when I called Shelly. That's what I was doing to myself. I was heaping shame on myself. And Shelly was talking to me, you know, it was kind of walking me through. And when she said, get off the cross, I had said, I'm just so embarrassed. I told so many people about it. Mm-hmm. You know, I was... It was not only that I had done that to myself, that I had damaged myself yet again. Yes. I, you know, that I had been walking out this new faith journey, this new maturity journey, this new emotional healing journey. And then I encountered Jake and I went out with new girlfriends and I told them all about my 50 cent behaviors. Like I told them all about it. And so when that shame came on me, I wanted to pull that weight of shame all over me. And not only for my own action, but I wanted to pull all of the shame, all of the things I had said to all those people, assuming that my telling them of my mistake would make me again, unlovable. So that's when Shelly said, get down off that cross girl. And she said something, you said something, and this is also in the book. You had something, you said something to me that was so powerful, Shell. You said, there will be a moment where you need to tell this story to people. And this is that moment. She said, this moment isn't just for you. So as you all walk through healing journeys, healing your 50 cent thinking, healing your 50 cent behaviors, you will have moments like these. And the moments that happen are those moments that you will share with others because I guarantee there are people that are experiencing the same thing and I'm sharing this moment with you so that you know that you're not alone and that I am still walking a full dollar boss life and these moments will come and I now metabolize them better and I'm able to work through them more. I know Eve said we we have 17 minutes left, Shell, and I wanna just make sure I serve your your crew here well. So I'm gonna walk through, if you're okay with it, I wanna walk through the rest of them. So again, it's just a one pager. And what I might do, Shell, is type this up and give this to people. And so we can make sure that we don't miss anything. Okay. Yeah. Up at the top, you have your 50 cent thinking, right? Mm-hmm. Your full dollar, your 50 cent belief, your 50 cent behavior, and the impact. Right underneath that, you have your full dollar birthright. Right. And that is you're gonna have to decide for yourself. And this is a process. And someone said in the in the panel, in the chat, someone said, What if I can't answer who I say I am? Wow, I missed that one. I just want to give you space around that. I want to give you grace and space. Know this, I will be praying for you that you will have an encounter that will clarify who you are. Right. At the same time, I ask you to be open to what you're hearing. Right. I had said it's a better word that gets spoken over you. I believe that we get a word. You get a word in your soul. Mm, yeah. my encouragement to you would be it's okay if you don't know right now just posture yourself in a position of openness and mm. listening and yeah. I will stand believing that you will hear mm. so in your full dollar identity you're going to write who do you say that you are and then underneath that once you kind of feel like you've gotten some clarity I want you to start listing out full dollar beliefs and full dollar behaviors and I hope that you have a whole list of full dollar beliefs and full dollar behaviors those behaviors will be mature behaviors and you'll recognize them like Shelly said that are different than 50 cents mm-hmm. 
Now we're going to get to what I call full dollar bossing. And I think Manny put it up there, full dollar, yeah. full dollar boss, but it's actually a verb. We're going to full dollar bossing. Okay. This is an action. And this action has three sections. And the first one is, so how you look at how you start to become a full dollar boss. I right. want you to start looking for people that have core alignment. Oh, that's good. Alignment. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's not about celebrity. It's not about success. Although I recognize that some of the people that you will be looking at will be celebrities. And that's common because we all know more about their lives than we might do, you know, other people who are sitting next to us in the cubicle. Okay. So you want to look for core alignment and what that looks like. Oprah has it. Michelle Obama has it. There are people that talk about who they are at an identity intelligence level. Oprah will say in commencement speeches, I know I'm a child of God. And again, I hear her alignment because her alignment mirrors my alignment. So I recognize her. Shelly mentioned a mirror. I recognize what core alignment sounds like to mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. You will need to recognize what core alignment sounds like to you. Okay. So start looking for full dollar bosses. And the mark of a full dollar boss is core alignment. Yes. Your identity intelligence. So you're going to want to get to what I call a state of the union. Okay. So oh. the state of the union is what's your, what's your current situation? What's real about your current situation? And this is mature thinking. Okay. This is about taking ownership and standing in authority. So yes. some of you, you may have lost a job. You may be unemployed. You may be in a bad relationship. When I left my relationship, it only, I was only labeled to leave my relationship because I got real about the relationship that I was in. I didn't wear rose colored glasses. I got real about it. You're going to need to get real about your situation. So anyone have a real situation you want to put up? Give me a real situation. And this is unemotional. Okay. We don't want to talk emotions. Like you don't want to say my boss is really not a good boss. And therefore this happened and my coworker got a promotion and I got, no, you just want to say brass tacks, state of the union, unemotional. What is it? Someone give me their state of the union. Give it to me. 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 I'm unemployed. My mom is homeless. Yep. Laura, I just wanna acknowledge that I have feelings about that. I feel the emotional impact of that for you. And I just wanna stand in the unemotional space of that, okay? That obviously hits emotionally, but as we move forward in this conversation, I wanna stand in the, in the statement of that. Thank you for sharing that. My com Ellen, my company closed in December. Yep, mm -hmm. yep, mm -hmm. okay. That's just a state of the union. Anyone else with the state of the union? I'm looking for work. I'm on academic probation. Great, Mose, Rosemary. Yep, state of the union. Yep. Okay, so the, the first step in becoming full, a full dollar boss and full dollar bossing is issuing a state of the union. Mm. Standing in front of yourself and all of your, you know, your own Congress, your own constituents mm -hmm. and be able to take ownership of the state of your union. That's mm. step number one. Step okay. number two is the state of affairs. And what I love about the state of affairs is so much of full dollar happens in the core. Okay, I'm afraid of failure. Yep, Monique, I hear that. Mm -hmm. So much of what happens in this process of finding your core alignment is internal. Uh -huh. There'll come a moment in the maturation process where you will be called to look outside of you. It's okay if you're not there yet, but once you start full dollar bossing, after you've done a state of the union, you're going to start looking around you. So when you say I'm on act, when you say my company closed in December, the next thing you're going to do, Ellen, is look around you to the needs of those around you and start planning and looking and determining your next move. And you're going to look to serve other people which isn't to say you're going to be making no money. You're going to start identifying where and how you can serve. That right. is full dollar bossing. Right. So state of affairs, just get real about your circumstance. State of the union, start looking for where you can serve. 
And the last one, I love Shelly that you said lock and load and you'll notice so many of my military phrases here, but this last one is all systems go. All systems go. And I wanna be super clear about all systems go. It doesn't mean the trigger has been pulled and you're off. Wow. All systems go is a 30, 60, 90 day plan. Wow. You need to get strategic, operational and tactical. So a full dollar boss is not a fly by the seat of my pants kind of person. That is 50 cent behavior. So once you've said, okay, here's the circumstance. My mom is homeless, whatever it is, you've stated something, okay? I'm unemployed. Let's go with that because I know a lot of people are gonna be encountering that. I'm unemployed. Now you're gonna look around you at the state of affairs as to where you can serve. That's gonna, all of that's gonna be your giftedness, your experience, your skill set, your desires, what you wanna do next. So, and that's a whole separate conversation. At its base level, it's where can I serve? Right. Frankly, where am I going to be happy? Mm. Because a full dollar boss understands they deserve happiness. Back to that, back to happiness. Love Back it. To happiness. Back to happiness. And then your all systems go is a 30, 60, 90 day plan. So Shell, I don't know if this is something that we want to do. I'm just going to postulate that we might want to. I'd love to start, you'd said at the, at the beginning, we want to talk about accountability. I'd love as people go through this process of full dollar bossing that either you through uh, redefining you or in conjunction with me, with full dollar, that we start tracking 30, 60, 90 day plans. And we help encourage people to execute that lock and load, all systems go. And, and some of you, and from I think everybody on here with the exception of maybe Monique and Nancy and Carrie haven't gone through the Blueprint Project and that's a part of it. So, mm -hmm. so there is a way for us, let's talk about how we can set that up, but that doesn't mean you wait on us to give you the green light. You have the green light to start, um, to plan, to walk out, map out um, what it is that you need to do over the course of the next 30, 60, 90 days. Something you said when you talked about looking at the state of like the state of, uh, of affairs, look around you. No, I noticed that what you did not say was look at your situation. No. We know what your situation is. And we also know that when you're not focused on you, is if you, you focus on the state of affairs around you where, and I love that you said, where are your giftings going? What, what can you do yeah. outward facing okay. to actually start to take a journey, walk through. And in the midst of that, can your own, you know, can your own situation start to change? Because when you outward facing, you're looking at the state of affairs around you and you start to invest in different things, doing different things, connecting, you're actually building a network that you don't really know of. I don't know if you want to call it a holistic network. I don't know if you want to call it, um, it's just, it's, it's like it, you'll naturally start to network and build and you won't even realize you're doing it. And then something has. Yeah. I see Manny asking, um, how, how deep detailed. is the state of affairs? How many aspects can you outline? Family, business, et cetera. Manny, as many as you think. Yeah. You'll notice when the president holds the State of the Union, it's long. <laughs> it's long. Brother, you go as long as you need. You outline every single aspect that needs to be addressed in your union. Yeah. If it's something that's surfacing for you, it needs to be written down. Mm -hmm. For sure. And I also want to say, Manny, um, I am, for anyone who's read From the Core, I am coming out with a From the Core workbook. We are in cover design right now. I expect it to come out in the next two months. That will have some of this that we've, that we've been doing in a journal. It will just help you further through this. Um, and I'm looking to have that come in the next couple of months. So please connect with me so that you'll be the first to know when that comes out. And so that'll be this process this? deeper. How about we do this? 30 yep. days from today or 30 days from now, we host another live webinar mm -hmm. to get, bring everybody back together, yep. right? Love it. Yes. Um, Love yes, you do care. Yes. Um, and so we'll just do that check-in. It doesn't have to be on Facebook Live. Core, maybe we can just create a classroom and, and we can just do a Zoom classroom where you start to just walk through it. Um, we have the, the capability, so we'll support you on that. And maybe we could just, how would you all feel about doing a, I just want to see in the chat um, or on Facebook, how would you all feel about doing a 
separate Zoom classroom check-in with CORE and just doing that 30, 60, 90 days um, uh, in the Zoom classroom. If you're if you're in if you're up for it, uh, let us know. I'm seeing I'm seeing it. That would be awesome to check. All right, all right, all right. I'm for it too. I'm down yeah. for it too. Yeah. So if you're on this Zoom call or if you're on Facebook and you're saying to Eve on Facebook Live that you want to be a part of the 30, 60, 90 day check in. Um, we would need you to message us your email. If you signed up for the Zoom, we have your email address. But if you didn't sign up for the Zoom and you are watching on Facebook Live, message us um, via our email info at to info at Redefine Future You and give us your email address so that you can, uh, yep, Quintessa, I see you on the watch party, uh, wants to be a part of it. So message me, um, Quintessa, I think I have your email address message us your email address so that we can add you to the distro list. And I think we just gonna create a separate classroom, Ms. Core. And the way that you, and, and I know we're not, we're not completely done, but we're yeah, done yet, but I just want you to know that this isn't over. I believe that this is, I'm, I'm so excited. I'm so, I'm like a little, I'm, I'm getting emotional. I've been, I've been real good. <laughs> You've been real good, girl. Um, I'm looking at um, so many people through on Facebook core. It's, this is just so amazing. Yeah. And what I want you all to do if you don't have the book is I want you to go on Amazon and I want you to look up this book mm -hmm. and I want you to purchase this book. That is your investment. Mm -hmm. That is your investment. And when I tell you by the 30 days from now, when we reconvene, y'all gonna have a whole lot to talk about. And I, um, you know, we're always talking about, um, oh, Kalina wants to join. So I've got some, so I got a whole nother watch party going on. Love it. Yes, Kalina. Okay, got you. We'll, I will make sure you get the email. Um, so that's Michelle, what we'll do. Michelle, do we have time? I know we're really perilously close to our time, but I'd love to just um, take a question or two. Do we yeah. have time for that? Okay. Yes. So if you all have questions for CORE, whether it's on Zoom or Facebook or on the Facebook watch party, because it's two or three of yeah. them going on. If you uh, have a question, please ask your question, um, put it in the chat, make a comment, and uh, we'll, we'll, we have a little bit of time to ask, do some Q&A. Yeah. Oh, this is so good. This is so good. This is oh, so good. you said she extended our time. I saw that. I saw that. So I hope y'all will hang out with us a little longer. <laughs> My battery, I've identified, okay. I've identified, Monique says, I've identified a lot of my State of the Union. Now, how do I see it differently? Monique, the State of the Union is not about seeing it differently. So if you can put up, give me an example of a State of the Union. And again, a State of the Union is simply unemotional. It's a statement of fact. So give me an example of the State of the Union. And again, while Monique, um, while we wait for Monique's um, State of the Union to come through, you know, State of the Union is again about taking authority of your circumstances. Uh -huh. so this is, we're now outside of full dollar, you know, you're already assuming your full dollar birthright. You're already living and believing, you're believing that you are a child of God or whatever it is that's at your core alignment. You're, you have firm foundational full dollar beliefs about your worthiness, your lovability, your acceptability. You are locked and loaded in that. And now you're behaving in a way that's full dollar. So once you get to the state of the union, it's really a clean slate. Shelly asked, how do I live new? This is about living new. So state of the union is really just simple, like um, state of the union might be someone said, my, I think it was uh, my mom is homeless. That's a state of the union. I don't have a job. That's a state of the union. Um, my pay got cut in half because of the coronavirus. That's a state of the union. My brother just died. That's a state of the union. So it's, it's about those things that are true in your present circumstance. And then again, once this workbook comes out and I hate pitching something that's not out because um, I want you guys to get your hands on it right now, but just know that, that there are so many levels underneath state of the union. Um, but really for you tonight, Monique, it's just about sitting with yourself in the quietness of your home and writing down what's true about your circumstance without any feeling and emotion. So it's not about, you said, I wanna change my bad attitude. That's really, 
you know, that's something different than state of the union. State of the union is just a statement of fact of what is true about your circumstances. So an attitude would be something we'd go back to full dollar and we'd, we'd get into like what, what exactly is a bad attitude and what is the belief? So a, a bad attitude is a 50 cent behavior, right? Having a bad attitude is a 50 cent behavior. So, so this is kind of, she, she feels blessed in her circumstances. So yeah. what, does it necessarily have to be a negative thing, a state of the union? No, so state of the union and Monique, I know you a little bit. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull forward your state of the union. Your state of the union is that you are considering a job change. You're considering a new path forward. We talked about fashion, your love of fashion. Oh, so that's different Monique. Yeah, that's oh, Monique. different Monique. Oh, Monique. Okay. So a state of the union, a different Monique, Monique Dubois. That's right. So a state of the union might look like you're looking for a new career. So your circumstances, you know, and it's, it's okay to say, you know, we have a, plenty of presidents who come out with the state of the union. That's all positive. Yes. Okay. Hold on real quick. Positive things. Yes, Eve. She said she can allow the attendees to speak if you want. Yes. 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 Unmute everybody. Yeah. See everybody on the screen. I'd love that. This is good, y'all. This is really good. Yeah. And um, I hope you all don't mind uh, that we we're, we went over our actual actual plan time. So we understand if you've been on too long, if you're on Facebook, but if you want to stick in here and stay in the group um, and join us, uh, we see your beautiful faces. Oh, this is so nice. That's good. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So I think Monique, Thank Monique, you. Monique Brown, now what's you, Monique Brown owns, has an amazing nonprofit, yeah. Bob Hope. So I would, you know, when you think about oh, your state of the union, Monique, yeah. what, do you, what do you think? I'm sorry, say again? Your state of the union. What, what, what are you thinking? that Because it, it doesn't have to necessarily be negative. Right. Well, I mean, if, if I sit here and look around, I, I have a, a beautiful house, mm -hmm. a, a, a van I just paid off, the one for Fob Hope. I have, uh, you know, we have two cars, we have dogs, we have our health. We, you know, I, I feel very blessed right now. The things that I need to work on, I feel like are inside. Yeah. Like um, I am so afraid of failure that I am not giving my wife, who I've only been married to a little over a year, enough time because I'm down there busting my butt in the office yeah. and have forgotten about her. And it's so easy for me to isolate down there. Monique, what is it? Were you able to identify a 50 cent thought? Well, you know, I, I've gone through cognitive processing therapy. So I went through all those 50 cent thoughts. I thought about how I used to think I was dumb. Yeah. And then I find that, um, and, and I still though, like I said, feel like I have to work a little harder than others. And that, and I think that may not be true, but I still have that belief. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because it's almost like a domino effect, right? If you have the belief that you have to work harder than others, and then your behavior is you're at the office for a long time, and the mm -hmm. impact of doing so is that you're not paying attention to your wife. Yes. Right? So it's a domino effect, and it's back in this top part. So you're still in this 50 cent thinking, and it's really the, and you know, Monique, I am not, I want to be clear, I am not a therapist. I am not a coach. I am simply someone, I'm a strategist and I was able to see the process that I was brought through, but, but I can't, you know, I can only sort of illuminate the process and my complete and utter conviction that what's left for you to answer in my very non-schooled opinion. And from, as someone who's walked through the process is that I would love for you to really get clear on your identity. Mm -hmm. Monique, it is the only thing I know that really starts working because, you know, I had a therapist too, as I was, you know, walking through th this process and I, I credit her with so much of the alliteration of what I was going through. She gave word to a lot of what I was going through, but nobody can give you your identity. Right. Can you unpack that. that for me a little bit? Which part? The, the, you say, when you say find my identity. Mm -hmm. So are you a person of faith? Yes. Okay. So when we look at what we are called to as children of God, it is to be whole, planted, and productive. Yes. What it sounds to me 
like is that you are focused on being productive without being focused on being whole. Yes. So you're still proving yourself. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So it's really just like spending time. And you know, if you read the book, have you read the book yet, Moni? No, but I will be buying it. You can save that copy I asked for. I'm going to buy it as soon as we get off. This. <laughs> well, and, and you know, and for people who are not in circumstances where a book purchase is, you know, is possible. I'm also mm-hmm. reading it chapter by chapter on YouTube. So that's open for everyone as well. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, but I really had to learn how to stand in my wholeness. It's not something natural. And we can know cognitively that we are children of God. We can even be people of faith. But I had to really, when I said I went through boot camp, I had to go through boot camp to get trained by God to depend on Him, rely on Him, and stay in a place of openness. Right. Let me just be clear, Monique. Everything has been stripped out of my life. Everything. Mm-hmm relationships, finances, jobs, right? It, God took me down to the studs Mm -hmm. so that the only thing left in my life was my wholeness. Mm. And I stand on that. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I don't know who, you know, I am so thankful I have Shelly in my life, but you need to get some people around you who can speak faith and speak your identity to you because your identity is that wholeness. Mm -hmm. And I would, go back to the word. I spend so much time and Shelly and I, you know, we toss prayer songs and praise worship songs back and forth to each other, not because it's fun, which it is, but because we both need it. Mm-hmm. We need it. Like we need air. Mm-hmm. There was a moment, um, you know, I, I shared with you a rejection that I got today on Facebook and, and I, and I shared it because rejection is really tough for me because again, my foundational 50 cent belief is that I'm not lovable. Mm-hmm. So well, for me, rejection is salt in a wound. That's a very, very deep wound. Right. And this was about two years into my full dollar bossing as I was learning and being trained and everything had been stripped away from me. And I had found out that, you know, I had gotten it. Let's just say I'd gotten another rejection and it was so intense. And it was, I had been, I had gone out for a job that I was a shoe in for. I got rejected for it. Mm-hmm. I was doing a, you know, event with someone that had been a friend of mine for five years and they just decided that whatever that, you know, they just decided not to do it felt like rejection. I had started dating someone. It was rejection again. I had made a new friend. She decided that my life was too hard for her. So she unfriended me. Mm -hmm. I was swimming in rejection, like swimming in it. And I, my parents happened to be visiting me in Seattle and I, I felt like I had to scream. Like I felt the rejection was so powerful and so deep that I almost felt like I couldn't handle it, that I might go crazy. Mm -hmm. And I got in my car, this was two o'clock in the morning. And I got in my car and I drove from Seattle to Idaho and back crying, praying, worshiping, Mm -hmm. you know, my car was my battleground. That moment changed everything for me. Mm-hmm. It trained me how to step out of my 50 cent, you know, because again, I, like I said, it's not like, it's not like you're ever going to feel different than you feel when you step in your 50 cent thinking. It's never going to feel different for you. Mm-hmm. Getting rejected for me on Facebook this morning hurt. It hurts. Mm-hmm. But I now know, I know where my battleground is. I get in my, got in my car today. Mm-hmm. I get in the shower, right? So I now have a practice that I step into so that I'm not, I'm not bound to my feelings. I'm not beholden to how I feel. Who cares how I feel? Who cares? Right. The yeah. question about your wholeness is, are you going to stand in your feeling or are you going to stand on your faith? Mm-hmm. So I got rejected this morning. I got in the shower. I started praising my tail off, Mm -hmm. you know, praying, God, please just, you know, this is hard for me. I just pray that you take this rejection feeling for me. I just pray that you surround me right now. Right. Like I just, I'm as the water is running over me, I'm praying. Mm -hmm. Then I get in my car and I blast that as loud as I absolutely can. Elevation worship is like on lock right now. And I've got, what do you, what would you say if he walks into the room and there is a King and I've got that so loud. I can barely write like it's eardrum splitting. 
and I'm singing and I'm not a good singer and I'm singing at the top of my lungs, mm -hmm. not because I want to, but because this is the only way I know how to remember my wholeness. Yes. And now less than 24 hours later, I mean, not even, not even girl, it took me, I don't know, maybe, maybe a half an hour to realign, maybe. It's your coping mechanism. That's wow. right. And it's, but it's not my coping mechanism. It's my realignment mechanism. Coping wow. is the 50 cent behaviors. That's mm, powerful. That's, that's, that was, I just need y'all to, I need you to, ever, I need you to take a moment to like what you just said. And I need you to just like, can you just inhale that right now? Mm -hmm. Can you just inhale that right now? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. And to think that you needed that moment so that you could be mindful. That's right. Isn't that like, you know, and we know that the battlefield is in the mind. It's in the mind. That's right. And, and we notice that I, I separated myself. I separated myself. I put myself in the shower. I'm at my parents' house right now, right? I could easily have gone and chatted with them. They were here chatting, reading the paper. I could have shared with them what had happened. I separated myself. Mm -hmm. I put myself in the shower. I put myself in the car. Hmm. So I held myself in consecration. And Did you separate yourself because you didn't want your, the, the effects of the rejection to spill out into conversations with your parents or just because you know that's what you need to do for yourself? I, both. I, well, let me say two things. Number one, my 50 cent behavior is oversharing. Mm. Okay. So if I believe that I am not worthy, then the way I used to get validation is by other people. So I would say, you know what she did? She did da, 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 da. And I would wait, I would tell the story until enough people had told me that that per, you know, that girl, she doesn't know you're so great. Whatever it was, what was the, the darkest berries, the sweetest juice. We seek out people mirroring validation when we need it. But for someone who's in 50 cent belief, it's never enough. Mm. I've never had enough people tell me I was right, tell me I was lovable, tell me I was okay, tell me that other person was wrong. It's never enough yeah. because the validation is coming from someone else. It has to come from here. And so the only, so to stop myself, again, I recognized a 50 cent thought. I stopped myself from 50 cent behavior my 50 cent behavior would have been to walk into the kitchen and share with my parents what had happened. Uh -huh. But instead, my full dollar belief is that I'm a child of God, whole and complete exactly as I am. My full dollar behavior is when I'm under attack to consecrate myself, to separate myself, to protect myself, to guard my heart. Mm -hmm. And I do that through praise. I do that through spending time in God's presence. I do that through worship. And I do that through prayer. I can't always do that when I'm around other people. Right. Yes. Yeah. So it's the training that's locked that in. That's yeah. the only thing you're going to need to develop. You know, really, first and foremost, we're going to need to really get at your 50 cent thinking and your 50 cent beliefs, get you into your full dollar beliefs and your full dollar behavior, and then really put you into training. Mm -hmm. You've just habituated something, Monique. That's all you've done. Right. You're just running a racket over and over and over again. Yes. You know who you are, right? So now you just need to allow God to put you into training. And I'll be really clear. It's, it's, um, God is as sacred as he is savage. Mm -hmm. It's a savage process. And I know mm -hmm. if you're in Shelly's group, I don't even need to know who you are. I know you're a warrior. So I know mm -hmm. you've got it in you, but this process of realigning yourself to the core is intense. Okay. Mm, Here, this okay. is oh, this is good. Oh my goodness. Okay, okay. So Carrie made a comment, if I may, um, about curious what ways this world this would manifest and look like for the different, I guess, hashtags. Is what she's saying. She's saying the different enneagram numbers. And Carrie, I unfortunately know very little about the enneagram, so I don't want to speak about that. I don't even know which number I am. So I, I, can't, I can't speak to that, but I know, here's what I will say, Carrie. The different numbers, yeah. This is why we love things like this because we love to know who we are. We love to know, and you know, there are two ways to develop identity intelligence. 
The first way is full dollar, right? The first way is to have God tell you who you are. That's the first way. The second way is to stand inside of the social mechanism that is human man, humankind and allow yourself to be reflected. And that comes through Enneagram, that comes through Archetypes of Style, which is another course that I do where we talk about what archetype and myth you are, that's super fun. All of those things are very fun and very useful. And developing a common vocabulary allows people to say, like, you know, Enneagram 4, I think is like the artist, right? It's kind of the sensitive, creative, quiet person, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so that Enneagram for someone else who knows, like, that's why you asked me about the Enneagram, because it's a way for us to develop a common vernacular. And so we can communicate with each other that way, right? Wow. So all of that's helpful and very useful. So there are two ways that you get identity intelligence through God aligning your identity at the core and through that beautiful thing that happens when we're all together and we start to see who we are by interacting with other people. Wow. And then I guess in that, in that sense, that can't be a place you're afraid to go. No. And then don't look at fear as a, as a bad thing. We've you know made it just this horrific thing, but there's a nervousness, but there's a, there's a, it's a, it's a, I always, Brianna doesn't like it when I combine words, but I always say, I'm a little nervous guided. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> That's brilliant. I'm nerve skited, you know? Yeah. And so if I'm nerve skited about something, it's less about fear and more about uh, expectation. Yeah. Um, I think in this conversation, in the conversations that are to come, what I think is important for everyone to understand and be mindful of is your expectations of yourself. Yeah. When I listen to Monique, you, you, you have one mindset and one expectation, but not, but not, it's not, it's not exactly matching what yeah. you hear your wife asking you for. And, and then you have to identify what is it? Why am I, why is that my safe space? And, and beyond me not thinking I'm good enough, it's, is there anything else? And so I need to bring that back home and, and be able to create, um, you know, define expectation in that space, especially if you understand or might know what that could be or should be, um, mm -hmm. that you're just present. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. just, Knowing that you're present and you don't have anything else going on at all. You're in a moment, you're present, and it can sometimes make you feel like you're missing out on doing something, specifically doing something, but you're not. Yeah. <laughs> you're not. <laughs> I feel like it. <laughs> like I want to say, Monique, too, you know, what I love about this process is that um, it's a big adventure. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're called into a huge adventure and God doesn't make a life small. God brings it to its highest possible fulfillment. Mm -hmm. I believe part of what you're striving for is a life lived big. Yes. And to be brought to your highest possible fulfillment. And that can Absolutely. feel like a struggle. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Like Carrie. you are here to be made big. Mm -hmm. I believe that. I and believe I can take all the junk and the baggage so that I can move on. Yeah. And what what um what had been said before about reaching, I think you said it about reaching for it. And like we go back to like the wholeness of God will bring the bigness about. Yes. Uh, yeah. You know? So and there's so much more. When I was saying reaching for it, you know, there's that thing that you feel yeah. in the pit of your stomach, right? And sometimes it is so bright. You can feel the brightness. That is the God that I know, right? Yeah. And so when I was saying reaching for it, I'm, I'm talking about inside. Yeah. And, and I guess that's an awakening, you know, wake up to it. Yeah. 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 I love it. There's so much, you know, I, I want to just say, Eve, my battery is now on red and I'm very far from a plug-in. So we probably <laughs> need to write that. I don't oh. just like fake black. <laughs> I, I love this. I wish we, so this is what we're going to do. If you're in this group or if you're on Facebook, we've already shared the email address that you need to send your information to. We will work with CORE to find another date and time where we can do another, it looks like a two hour segment, yeah. but it won't be live on Facebook. This will be a private, um, this will be even, I mean, 
Mm -hmm. This is blowing my mind, but this will, it'll be a session, a 30, 60, 90 day session, specifically with CORE, we're sponsoring the um, platform and we're gonna provide all the, the, the things that she needs. And we want you to come ready with the assignment. Um, and she, what does that look like? So we thank you so, 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 so very much. And just really, really understand that this journey that you're on, this identity that you're seeking or that you, you, that you see, it's, mm -hmm. it's not unobtainable. You are, you can be new, you can, but you have to go through a process. Oh. You have to go through a process. Yeah. So you're going, if you feel like you're in that moment, that space in between challenge and triumph, this is the space where I believe that Corey has been talking to you about, about going, that's those schisms, those moments, those times. And, and um, so we can't wait to hear it either. Laura says she can't wait to see our updates in 30 days. Don't forget to email us. Please feel free to share this. It's still it's streaming live on Facebook. And as we go out, we thank you so much for all of your time. Um, mm -hmm. You said, don't log off, Core. Uh, <laughs> we thank you for your time. And we hope that we were able to um, invest in you in the yeah. best way that we know how through our authenticity and our transparency. Yeah. And then just through being as real as we know to be. So I pray that you have a great week. Find, be kind, find something else to invest in outward facing that you can do some work in, pay attention to whatever that is, set new goals, whatever those are and honor yourself first so that you can show up whole for everyone else. That's right. Shelly Willis, I've been here for the last two hours almost with Cordelia Yoakum and I love her and I'm, I'm her champion. I'm one of her champions, one of many. And like we said, we want you to be the best that you can be. Keep redefining. Thank you. Oh my goodness. <laughs>